In this episode, we're looking at the neurological exam of the upper limb. As always, be sure to prepare first before any assessment, remembered with the wipe mnemonic. For washing hands and wiping down equipment, introducing ourselves to the patient and confirming their identity, obtaining permission to perform the exam, including roughly what it involves, as well as positioning the patient, which in this case is generally lying supine at a 45 degree angle, as well as asking for any pain they currently have. Expose them appropriately, in this case that is exposing from the shoulders to the hands, and equipment needed include a sharp object like a neuro tip, a tendon hammer and a tuning fork. We begin by observing the patient generally. The mnemonic SWIFT helps us remember scars such as from previous surgeries or trauma, wasting of muscles that may be symmetrical or asymmetrical and can reflect atrophy from disuse or lower motor neuron lesions. Also remember hypertrophy here that can be the result of compensation. The I is for involuntary movements including career that are irregular brief contractions that appear to flow between muscles seen in Huntington's disease. Myoclonus, that are brief, involuntary, irregular contractions, and tardive dyskinesia, that are repetitive, involuntary body movements with lip smacking, tongue protrusion, and grimacing. F is for fasciculations, that are small, localized muscle contractions visible beneath the skin. I also include face here, looking for features like hypomimia, meaning a reduction in facial expression seen in patients with Parkinson's disease, as well as any drooping or asymmetry. The T is for tremors that may be resting, meaning minimal during activity, or action tremors that become more apparent during particular movements. We then move on to tone, which is the muscle's resistance to passive stretching. For the upper limb, we test this by supporting the patient's elbow and holding their hand in a handshake position and asking them to allow the examiner to take the weight of the limb and gently move the wrist, elbow and shoulder through the ranges of motion. We feel for the resistance throughout these motions. Excess resistance is termed hypertonia and mostly reflects an upper motor neuron lesion. Both rigidity and spasticity are examples of hypertonia but rigidity is independent of velocity, which means that regardless of how fast the limb is moved, the resistance feels similar, and this is sometimes called lead pipe rigidity. It is the result of extrapyramidal causes, such as Parkinson's disease, and when a tremor is superimposed, it is described as cogwheel rigidity. Spasticity is velocity dependent, meaning that the faster the limb moves, the more resistance is felt, sometimes described as clasp knife rigidity. It is due to pyramidal causes like a stroke. A lack of resistance called hypotonia is typically associated with lower motor neuron lesions. Next is power, which is assessed using the MRC scale from zero to five. Zero is no visible muscle contraction. One has visible contraction, but with no or trace movement. 2 is limb movement but not against gravity, 3 has movement against gravity but not resistance, 4 has movement against at least some resistance, and 5 is full strength. As power is being assessed, a particular myotome is tested and should be compared with the other side. For the upper limb, this is done via shoulder abduction for C5, tested by asking the patient to move their arms out to their sides, typically with the elbows bent, as you resist by pushing down. Shoulder adduction for C6 and C7, tested by asking them to move their arms down from abduction to their sides, as you resist by pulling up. Elbow flexion for C5 and C6, where the patient places both arms in front of them with elbows flexed like a boxer's pose, and resist as you try to pull and extend the elbow. Elbow extension test C7, C8, done by asking them to push out against your resistance from the boxer's pose. Remember, C5, C6, pick up sticks, C7, C8, lay them straight. 
wrist extension and wrist flexion are tested for C6 and C7, where the patient holds out their arms and extend and flex the wrist against your resistance. Fingers are also tested. Finger extension for C7, abduction for the ulnar nerve component of T1, tested by asking the patient to spread their fingers out as you try to squeeze them together. And we have thumb abduction for the median nerve component of T1, tested by asking the patient to point the thumb to the ceiling with the palms facing upwards as you try to push the thumb down. Upper motor neuron lesions tend to affect the upper limb extensors more so than the flexors, whereas lower motor neuron lesions will tend to cause a focal pattern of weakness. A phenomenon known as the pronator drift is often tested here as well, where the patient is asked to hold out both arms straight with the palms facing the ceiling and then asked to close their eyes. In cases of upper motor neuron lesions of the corticospinal tract, pronators are more active than the supinators, leading to pronation of one of the arms, which is usually contralateral to the lesion, with some associated weakness that manifests as lowering of the affected arm. Next up are the deep tendon reflexes. Reflexes are involuntary contractions occurring in response to a stretch of a tendon. And these are useful in distinguishing between an upper and lower motor neuron lesion. They are best assessed using a tendon hammer by holding its tip and letting the rubber head fall onto the tendon, often with your finger in between. Bear in mind that the reflexes can be difficult to elicit, and if they're absent, you should try reinforcing maneuvers like jaw clenching or gendrastics maneuver where the patient hooks their fingers together and pulls apart to help increase the reflex. The most commonly used in the upper limb are the biceps and brachioradialis reflexes, testing C5 and C6, elicited by percussing the medial side of the anterior cubital fossa while covering it with your thumb, and percussing halfway of the posterior lateral forearm, respectively. The triceps reflex tests C7 and C8, and involves relaxing the arm with the elbow flexed, and percussing the posterior aspect of the distal humerus, just above the olecranon process of the ulna, and observing for contraction of the triceps. Hoffman sign is a sign of upper motor neuron lesions, that's indicated by flexion of the other digits of the hand when the distal phalanx on the middle finger is flicked downwards. Although the mechanisms are different, it is similar to the Babinski reflex on the foot. Hyperreflexia, meaning excessive reflex response, is associated with upper motor neuron lesions, as there is normally some inhibition coming from the central nervous system that is lost in upper motor neuron lesions. Hyporeflexia is associated with lower motor neuron lesions, affecting the normal reflex arc. Next is coordination. Be sure to have checked power before this, as weakness can present as poor coordination that could otherwise be caused by cerebellar lesions. Tests include the finger to nose test, where the patient is asked to touch their nose and then the examiner's finger, that is placed just within the patient's reach and moved from side to side. Observe for the patient missing the finger by under or overshooting, known as dysmetria, as well as any tremors that appear, particularly when their finger is close to that of the examiner's. Dysdiadocokinesia, which is the inability to perform rapid alternating movements, is tested by asking the patient to rapidly lay their right palm on top of the left, then flip the right hand so the dorsum touches the left palm, and repeat multiple times, as well as on the opposite hand. These both indicate possible cerebellar lesions on the same side as the affected limb. Sensation is the least objective component of the upper limb examination however, can still provide clues as to any underlying neurological problems. It involves touching the patient with different objects in particular dermatomes and assessing for any discrepancy between the dermatomes and both arms. It normally begins by confirming the patient can feel the neuro tip or cotton wool on the sternum first before moving onto the arms. Varying modalities are tested as different tracts are involved in different transmissions. The spinothalamic tract and dorsal column are crudely assessed with light touch, but the spinothalamic tract also carries pain sensation, for which we use the pinprick. 
Dorsal columns also carry vibration sensation, which is assessed using a tuning fork. By placing the vibrating tuning fork on the interphalangeal joint of the patient's thumb, if they are able to feel the vibrating stop as you interrupt the tuning fork, the column is intact. If sensory deficits are found, then continue to move from distal to proximal to identify if at any level the sensation becomes normal. That may suggest a disturbance in the region of that spinal level. Remember that a neurological exam not only detects neurological deficits, but helps in identifying where the deficit is arising from. In general, upper motor neuron lesions are indicated by an increase in tone, hyperreflexia, positive Hoffman sign, and reduced power in a pyramidal pattern, which is weaker extensors than flexors in the arms and the opposite in the legs. Lower motor neuron lesions tend to feature a reduction in tone, reduced reflexes, normal Kaufman sign, and reduced power. Complete the exam by thanking the patient and asking them to dress, summarizing your findings, as well as considering any further assessments or imaging that may be required.